Well, I'm delighted to see many of you back from last week to join us for our new series of messages, The Original Top Ten. We'll be looking at the relationship between the Old Testament Ten Commandments and New Testament grace. Uh, recent surveys show that most people don't know the Ten Commandments. They don't know what they are. So why don't we start by seeing what we know, okay? So we'll just put uh, ten blanks up there. You shout out. Now, in the original uh, Ten Commandments that Moses walked down with, they were all two words. Lo, uh, the Hebrew word for no, and then something else. So I've just put no, 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 no down there. But shout it out. What, what commandments do you know? No gods, Okay. No idols, okay. No murder. No coveting. Okay, no dishonoring parents. No adultery. What? No taking the Lord's name in vain. I think we got a couple to go. No stealing. Okay. Did I hear lying? No lying. No forgetting the Sabbath. Here they are. There they are. Okay. Good job. You guys are top of the class. Valedictorians. Nice. All right. The place to begin is by asking if the commandments are relevant today. Or are they obsolete? Uh, do they relate to our current problems of global warming and terrorism and cyber attacks? Uh, nobody likes to be told what to do today, so are the commandments out? Since the Old Testament, Testament records God's law, and the big idea in the New Testament is grace, are the Ten Commandments still obligatory for Christians? Uh, the Apostle Paul writes, a person is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So do we need to keep the commandments? They don't get us into heaven anyway. What is the relationship between the Old Testament law to Christians who live under grace? Let me make three comments. Christ brought an end to ceremonial and sacrificial laws. Uh, he was one sacrifice for all people for all time, so all the laws about bringing rams and, uh, you know, turtle doves and uh, lambs for sacrifice and grain offerings, all those are done. Next, Christ brought an end to, to the condemning power of the moral law. Since Christ lived a perfect, sinless life, and then He died for all of our sins, taking our sins on Him, He, now if we admit that we can't get to heaven by keeping the Ten Commandments, we fall very short uh, and put our faith in Him, then when God sees us, He sees Christ's merit for us. And so there's no more condemnation on us. Our guilt is gone. Next, Christ did not bring an end to the moral law. Christ did not come to abolish the moral law, but to fulfill it. At this point, the separation between Old Testament and New Testament is not that sharp. There's grace in the Old Testament. There's law in the New Testament. In fact, uh, there's no well-grounded hope for salvation without obedience to the law. Uh, James says, faith without works is dead. If anything, there's a higher expectation in the New Testament for followers of Christ to keep the law because now we have the Holy Spirit who gives us the power to actually do it. So the Ten Commandments have significance for us not as a means of justifying ourselves to get us into heaven, but as a means of demonstrating that we've received Christ and that we love Him. So the Ten Commandments are still God's will for us and a means of showing our love for Him, so we must know them and obey them. The gospel of Jesus Christ is characterized as good news. You might wonder, do the Ten Commandments present us with good news? You bet they do. Uh, the Ten Commandments are good news for at least three reasons. Throughout the Old and New Testaments, the Ten Commandments fill three vital roles. First, the Ten Commandments assure us there is absolute right and wrong. In the Ten Commandments, God speaks to us. He says, I am the God who created the universe and created you, and I've given you commandments based on my holy character. Not only were these commandments given to the Hebrew people, 
but we have good evidence that they were given to every person that's been born into this world. If you study ancient and modern cultures, there's a surprising similarity between the, the moral code, even though they're divergent cultures. Uh, this tells us that all human beings have a basic understanding of right and wrong. Uh, without these generally recognized standards, what basis would there be for us to bomb an airfield in Syria for them using sarin gas on children and babies? Uh, how can we call Assad to account for war crimes unless there's a higher standard that all nations can appeal to? Absolute standards of right and wrong are good news for our, our world today. Recent study, study says 93% of people say, I decide and I alone what is right and moral for me. We may think that's a good thing, that each person decides what's right for him or herself, but that leads to anarchy. When there's no right and wrong, society breaks down. We can't survive. We may think we would like to live without commandments, but we need them. Everyone appreciates the law. We love rules, and I'll prove it to you. All football players love the rules of football. Player, uh, uh, of football. All football players, whether at the professional level, collegiate level, high school or younger level, love the rules of football. If you've ever played a pickup game at the beach uh, or uh, at a, a, a field somewhere, what's the first thing you do? You set up rules. You decide where the end zone is, what the boundaries are, what constitutes a tackle. I mean, you can't have people running every which way. You can't have somebody throwing the ball from, from the sidelines. Uh, there has to be rules. There have to be boundaries. And that's what the Ten Commandments provide for us. They provide us boundaries of what is the absolute right and wrong. Second, the Ten Commandments are given for our good. Uh, God's laws were not given to take away our freedom, but to liberate us from the vices that enslave us. Moses writes, and now, O Israel, what does the Lord going for a while. There we go. Um, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I'm giving you today for your own good. God's commands are for our own good. Uh, they're like a doctor's prescription and therapy for our health and well-being. When Jesus gave the most important commandment, he said, read this with me. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God the Lord is one. Love, is it up there? The Lord your God with all your soul, heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Now how can God get away with commanding us to love him? It's because he knows that we only find our greatest freedom and most fulfillment in life when we love him and obey his commands. So the law is for our own good. The law protects us from ourselves and from others who would do us harm. Now suppose you're out driving with your family. You're driving in your 1999 three-cylinder Kia Rio. You can't afford a new car, so you're still driving this rig with 220,000 miles on it. and You're driving along and all of a sudden it sputters and you pull off and it dies. Just then a big black car pulls up behind you and Four big guys in leather, black leather jackets get out with clubs in their hands and you start pushing your manual locks on the car and rolling up the window of your manual and uh, you're sweating freely now. Well, just then the Oregon State uh, helicopter patrol flies over and sees you in your predicament and calls in two squad cars. They arrive just as the thugs are reaching for your door. You turn to your family and say, let's give a cheer for the Oregon State Police. You're excited when the law protects you from those who would do you harm. Now, on the other hand, we resent the law when we're the tyrant. Let's suppose you're out in your Porsche 911. 
and you take it off of speed control. The only reason you had it on speed control is to keep you from getting a ticket, and you press down on the accelerator and feel that surge of power and watch it climb to 75, 80, 85, 90. You're just loving it. And then you look in your mirror and you see something that makes your stomach sick. The red and yellow and blue lights of the Oregon State Police. Do you now lead a cheer for the Oregon State Police? No, you resent the law when, we're, when you're the tyrant. But even when we resent the law, the law is for our good. Third, the Ten Commandments bring us to see our need for, yeah, you want to bring a, I'd love that. Because I don't like standing here in one spot. Um, the Ten Commandments help us see our need for Christ. Uh, they act as a guardian to draw us uh, to Christ. They show how far we fall short. Uh, when Jesus delivers his famous Sermon on the Mount, he takes the commandments and he raises the level. He makes the standard even higher. Uh, before, uh, he, he says, you've heard you shall not murder. But I tell you, if you're angry with your brother, you've already committed murder in your mind or in your heart uh, before. Okay. Um, Thanks, Chuck. So he says, uh, you've heard before that uh, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, whoever looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So he raises the standards so they're totally impossible to achieve. And so we're driven by seeing how far we fall short to uh, coming to the lawgiver and crying for mercy. But that's actually a good thing. When we come to Jesus for mercy, we're admitting that we can't get to heaven on keeping the Ten Commandments and that we need His power working within us. So the commandments are still relevant and good. Now, let me help you understand the context in which they were given. Moses led the people out of Israel, out of slavery, or out of Egypt, and uh, his mighty miracles were able to get them out of Egypt. And once they'd gotten away from the Egyptian chariots and the bullets had stopped flying and they were in the, the, the wilderness, they faced a new challenge. How will they live now that they're free? People talk about a need for regime change in Syria. Assad must go. But history has shown that removing a tyrant is the easy part. Um, getting Al-Qaeda out of Afghanistan was, didn't take very long. Uh, but getting Afghanistan to, to rule itself has been a nightmare. Uh, getting Gaddafi out of Libya was easy. But in the vacuum that was left behind, getting governance has been just a, a total challenge. Uh, Getting Saddam Hussein, catching him in Iraq was easy. But getting the, the groups to work together to govern has been next to impossible. Many countries have learned that far harder than winning a revolution is the process of setting up a political and economic structure that works. You cannot understand the Ten Commandments unless you understand this context. Helping a revolution is sort of like helping somebody who has drowned. You get them to shore and they spit up water out of their lungs and now what? I mean, you can't live in crisis mode forever. Uh, you can't have an emergency every day of the week. Some, at some point you have to get down to living a, you know, a regular life. Now, this has been the undoing of many rev revolutions. What happens after the revolutionaries throw off the tyrants? What happens after the revolution in Libya or Syria? After God helped the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt and they reached the wilderness, they had two choices. They could continue to follow Moses as the absolute monarch or they could say we're not going to have any leader and move toward anarchy. I mean, there are dangers at both extremes, a totalitarian regime and anarchy. Moses goes up the mountain 
and is given by God a better way. He goes up as the absolute monarch of Israel and he comes down under the law. The king as well as the people is under the law of God, under the Ten Commandments. Remember when David sinned by committing adultery with Bathsheba? So he, they have adultery and uh, then she's pregnant. So to cover it up, he puts her husband Uriah to death. And then he quickly takes her as his bride. And a year later, they're together, David and Bathsheba. They have their new baby. And Nathan, the prophet, pays them a visit. He tells them a parable of a man who receives a guest in the, uh, late at night. And rather than taking one of his lambs to, to slaughter for the meal, or one of his hundreds in his flocks, he goes to his neighbor and takes his one little ewe lamb that he sleeps with at night and slaughters this for his guests. And David's incensed. And then Nathan, in one of the most powerful prophetic lines in all the Bible, says, You are the man. You took Bathsheba, the love of Uriah's life, and you killed him and took her as your wife. I mean, no prince could say that to the Pharaoh in Egypt. No Babylonian noble could say that to the king. But you could say that to David, the king in Israel. Because both the king and the people are under the law. Now we're ready for command number one. Exodus 20, verse 1. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. He says, I'm the God who created the heavens and the earth, and I created you. I'm omnipotent. But he's not just that. He says, I brought you out of slavery. He's also a loving God who saw the, a crowd of slaves locked in Egypt and he brought them out. Then he continues, you shall have no other gods before me. He tells them when they enter into the land of Canaan, they will discover competition for their allegiance. The fact that God commands us to put no other gods before Him signals that we are inherently religious. If you don't, if you don't worship God, it doesn't mean you'll be non-religious. You will worship something else. Apostle Paul shows us this truth in his famous text in Romans 1. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. When we refuse to obey God, we don't become non-religious. We simply worship something else. God says, don't do that. Just a short time ago, we said to the people of Israel, I brought you out of oppression in slavery in Egypt. Then I took you out into the wilderness, and when you were hungry, I fed you manna and quail. When you were thirsty, I brought water out of a rock. What other God could do that for you? I alone am the God who created you and the only God, only God that can sustain you. So don't worship other gods. Now you're probably wondering why I take so much time talking about don't worship other gods. Am I afraid that you're worshiping strange deities? I doubt if there's a single person here today that has a shrine at home that you bow down to. I do fear, however, that many of us, myself included, have allowed other concerns to become our gods. We've allowed these concerns to take a position that's usurping the position God alone should have. Does he have ultimate authority in your life? Is he the chief executive officer in your life? To help us probe these questions, I have three questions to assist us in determining if we have other gods. One, who or what is the object of our affections? What do you think of when you have free time? Now, I realize most of us don't have a lot of free thinking time. We just are ramming through every day from one responsibility, uh, one assignment to the next. And, uh, but when you do 
have some free time, maybe you're bicycling or you're jogging or maybe when you lay down in bed at night and your mind is free to think about whatever, what do you think about? Likely, that may indicate the real gods in your life. Does your mind settle on your job? On your boyfriend or girlfriend? On athletic pursuits? On money? Your dream house? Accomplishments you're hoping to do? Recreation? Pleasure? Your answer probably reveals the true gods in your life. Moses warned the people of Israel that when he prospered them in the new land, it would be easy for them to forget him. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your cars get newer, and your stock portfolios increase, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. If we truly have no other gods above God, then when we have free time, our minds will focus on God. We'll delight in Him. We'll love to pray to Him. We'll want to spend time in His Word. While 2.2 billion people claim to be Christians in this world, the chief competitors to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to the Pew Research Center, is Islam, 1.6 billion adherents. Uh, Atheism, secularism, 1.1 billion. Uh, That would include atheists, agnostics, people that just check on a survey, what's your religious affiliation? None. And then Hinduism, 1 billion people. I think one of God's competitors today uh, that we've made a God of is tolerance. Tolerance is the belief that all beliefs are the same, they're all equal, they have equal validity, and so we go out of our way to show deference to people with different beliefs. But I think this God of tolerance has led us to make a God out of the U.S. Constitution. We've taken Amendment 1, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, and made respecting other people's beliefs more important than respecting God. We've come to protect and cherish what God prohibits. God clearly tells us, you shall have no other gods before me. Many of us have made tolerance a higher value in our affections than God. Two, we must ask, who are we trying to impress? Every day we get up, we push, we work, we go to school, we we work hard, we get things done. Who are we trying to impress? This is another question that can help us determine the real gods in our lives. Maybe you're a people pleaser. You want to impress people at work or at school. Members of your family or people in your neighborhood or at the club. You've allowed other people's opinions to become your god. But if you want to obey the first commandment and put no other gods ahead of God, you, we must make it our mission to be God-pleasers. We say, God, I want to put you first, nothing else above you. I want to make you top priority in my life. I want your spirit to lead me. I want to obey you and your word. Third question that might help us determine our true God is, what are we living for? You ask, what is my primary objective in life? What am I trying to accomplish? Is it pleasure? Gaining a position? Building an empire? The best way to determine what you're living for is to look at how you're spending your time. Usually we find our priorities by how we spend our time. People who love God first are trying to bring honor to Christ. The Ten Commandments are not given in random order. The first commandment is given at first place in prominence for good reason. All our efforts to keep the Ten Commandments hinge on our commitment to love God with our whole heart. And to evaluate our love for God, we must ask ourselves, what is the object of my greatest affection? Who am I trying to impress? And what am I living for? Let's pray. 
Father, thank you for these Ten Commandments that present us with your absolutes of right and wrong, built on your holy character so they don't change with changing times. And we thank you for those. We need these. And Lord, we do want to put you first. And if you've never asked Christ into your life, that would be the first step to putting God first in your life. You just ask him to come into your life and be Lord of your life and tell him you believe he died for you and you want him to forgive your sins. You can do that right now. I want to give you all just a moment to pray. Maybe you pray, and if, if, if this is how you feel, that you want to put God first, you tell him that, and maybe confess some of the other things that are competing for your top, top spot in your mind. Uh, you pray. Thank you, Father, for being a great God, and we realize you are so great. You need to be first in our lives. We are liberated. We are in our best spot when we love you with our whole heart and seek to obey your commands. So we commit ourselves, recommit ourselves to putting you first today in Jesus' name. Amen.